This is the Welcome to the Sky podcast, your place for conversations about the best thing in the world, flying. I'm Lou Dix, your host and friend as we talk about everything from flight training, aviation news, how to become a better pilot and much, much more. I've got a lot to say, so sit back, relax and let's get this thing off the ground on the Welcome to the Sky podcast. All right, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of the Welcome to the Sky podcast. Uh, happy to be back uh, making another podcast episode. It's been a little bit since the last one. And for those watching on uh, YouTube, I apologize for the appearance. I just woke up recently, but the stuff that I have to talk about today could not wait. So uh, we're here recording the podcast. Um, got a couple of things to talk about today. One of the things is uh, what I think a CFI should be and something that I saw on uh, one of my Instagram videos that um, that I wholeheartedly disagree with. And uh, and I think uh, it's, it's going to be a good topic to kind of talk about for people in flight training, but uh, more relevantly, the uh, the people that are going to uh, become a CFI or people that are CFIs teaching the next generation of uh, aviators, wherever that might be. I think it's going to be a good, good conversation to have. And uh, another conversation that we're going to have is uh, about a high profile event uh, that happened, um, caused outrage in the aviation world. There has been uh, some developments as to uh, a punishment for the actions uh, of that individual. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about this uh, situation in my uh, Instagram comments. Um, first of all, though, for those that don't know, I am a uh, CFI, CFII and ATP certificate holder. Uh, and I have a passion for aviation, passion for aviation, a passion for instructing and doing things the right way in uh, flight training for the students. Uh, I, I have a vision of a better flight training than, uh, than at least than I went through. And from the conversations that I've had with many people over the years who have had similar experiences to me, a better way than uh, what they've been exposed to in their uh, particular flight training. Um, you know, it's well documented on my channel and in my podcast that I did not have a good experience uh, during my initial flight training for my private pilot training. I was taken advantage of by the flight school who stole all my money. The the, the podcast episode is out there for you to go and uh, watch and listen to if you're interested in all that. But when I became a flight instructor, I wanted to create an environment for students that, you know, it, it's all about the student, right? It's not about the flight instructor. Uh, the, you know, the flight instructor is there to impart knowledge, to get the students to a goal of becoming a pilot and becoming a safe pilot. I think that should go without saying, but I think that's sometimes lost with, with some instructors. I think flight training should be goal oriented, scenario based, and you should be training for real world scenarios for things to happen in the real world. Um, again, we'll dive a little bit into that shortly, but, uh, th the biggest thing that you find on my channel, I think, along with all of that is making flight training fun for the students. I, I didn't have a lot of fun during my initial flight training. And, uh, that is probably one of the biggest reasons that I want to make things fun for my students. I mean, it's the type of person that I am anyway. I like having fun no matter what I'm doing. And I, I feel like students are paying a lot of money to you know, pay for an aircraft and pay for a flight instructor to teach them how to fly. So why not have fun while you're doing it? There is a way, there is a way. And I prove this time and time again in my videos and every day that I go and fly that you can have fun and also be a safe pilot. It is possible. And I do it all the time on my channel. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that. But this kind of leads me into what an instructor should be. <laughs> What should an instructor be? Well, obviously an instructor needs to be knowledgeable. You need to have knowledge of the subject area in which you are teaching. But it's about keeping yourself up to date with everything and keeping yourself as, as knowledgeable as you possibly can. And if you don't know something, don't start sprouting off wrong answers, go and lock it up. An instructor needs to be adaptive, which in, in the sense that you have students that learn one way and you have other students that might learn a different way. You might have people that are book learners, people that are visual learners. So you've got to be prepared and adaptive to people's different learning styles. And to that point, you need to have multiple different ways of getting through to the students, uh, different ways of communicating. You, you've kind of got to be, you know, you're not just a flight instructor. You're, you're a psychologist, you're a friend, you're a mentor. You're, you're all these different things as an instructor that I, I'm not so sure that some instructors or potential instructors know that going in. I certainly didn't. 
I, I learned that through the fundamentals of instruction studying that I did. And it, it truly is over the years, I've, I've truly, truly have many, many different interactions where I've thought I'm, I'm being more of a psychologist here than I am a flight instructor. You've got to get inside the mind of a student pilot and uh, dive deep in there and, you know, all these different like uh, defense mechanisms and, you know, why, why is the student acting like this today? Where, you know, it might be stress, might be fatigue, you know, you gotta, you gotta really read what the student is doing. So I, and I, I think that's a big point that maybe some CFI applicants don't realize it's much more than just knowing how to teach something it's about understanding what is going to make sense to a student is a student actually listening to what i'm saying there's been many ground sessions that i've done where i've looked to the student and i'm you know using a lecture method of instructing and their eyes are just glazing over and at that point it's like oh okay i'm, I'm gonna to have to change this to keep them engaged here you know so it's all about being adaptive and and having multiple ways of getting through to students moving off that patience Patience is absolutely key. Every instructor will tell you there's been a moment, many moments in flight training where they've just want to turn to the side, roll up a bit of newspaper and whack the student on the head with it because they're not listening or they're not uh, doing things the correct way after 20 times of practicing it. That's just the way flight training is. It, you, you go as, as much as you can until the, the student gets it. And it takes a lot of patience and it can be quite frustrating, but you have to have patience as a, as a flight instructor. Uh, the, the biggest one here, always training for the real world. We should not be training students to just tick a box. You, you don't have, while you're flying, a clipboard in front of you saying, okay, do this once, once it's done once, we'll tick that box, we move on to the next thing. No, that's not the way that we should be training the future of aviation, the future pilots that are gonna be keeping our skies safe, hopefully. That starts with the flight instructor and it's not about ticking a box and just getting something done to be able to move on. The student has to be doing things correctly, has to be proficient at what they are doing and ticking a box is not good enough to make that happen. And that's why this podcast episode has come about today, really. Um, I created a, a reel on Instagram, made a little video for Instagram. And in that reel, I demonstrated a power on stall and the way that I teach and the way that I do a, a power on stall. I, uh, and I'll tell you what, let's watch it, shall we? Well, power on stall, once we get to our rotation speed, we're gonna go full power. Uh, this thing is gonna rise on us, okay? Let me ask you this, when we're in, in, a, in a climb, what's gonna try and take us off to the left side? Um, one of the left turning tendencies. One of them, or even all of them, how about that? So it's really important to keep that right rudder, so I'll kind of show you what it does without the rudder, and then I'll add the rudder in there, but here we go. So this is the power on the stalls. But the only thing you've got to maintain altitude is the nose. You've got to raise angle of attack to increase lift. So you see, I'm increasing, increasing, increasing. This is decreasing, decreasing, but this is staying the same. That's what we want to see. So now we're going to go full power. Now, I'm, I'm not going to touch the rudder. You see the nose going off left? Oh yeah. That's not what we want. So you keep the right rudder in there. Just keep pitching up, pitching up, pitching up, and it'll get to a certain point where it Whee! can no longer hold itself. It comes down, I'm using rudder. I'm using rudder to maintain the, uh, the heading. And we're gonna power back. So in my initial private pilot training, I was always taught to stall the aircraft that I was flying uh, in a power on stall with full power. And uh, was told to be ready for the check ride, knowing how to do a power on stall at different uh, power levels, basically. Now, you've got to think, private pilot training, I was flying and we, you know, in the video, I'm flying a Cessna 172. It's either a Cessna 172 or a Piper Cherokee. One of the two is, is what I used during my private pilot training. So obviously when you're taking off with, uh, in, in those aircraft, you are full power, right? You're taking off full power. Now the power on stall is essentially a, uh, a, a, a takeoff stall. There's obviously other, you know, as I progressed in training and got to other more complex aircraft with different uh, with different systems and you know uh, different engines, that changed a little bit. And obviously, if you are flying those aircraft, you fly the way that the manufacturer tells you to fly it, and you, you fly it uh, within its limits and what is safe and appropriate for that aircraft. Flying single engine aircraft, four cylinder, you know, 180 horsepower maybe at the max, and uh, yeah power on stall with full power. 
I believe, and I know that you should know how to do that. Um, but let's read the comment that uh, came onto this video. A lot of favorable comments, uh, actually, which I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see people enjoying the, the reels that I'm making, the content that I'm making. If you want to follow me on Instagram, uh, I'll put the, the link in the description of this video. Uh, and I'll put it on screen as well for you to see. But the, uh, the message from this person was, or the comment from this person was, it's not necessary to use full power for power on stall. The ACS specifies set power as assigned by evaluator to no less than 65% available power. My jaw hit the floor when <laughs> I saw that comment, but I, th I thought to myself, you know what? That That's not a flight instructor. That sounds to me like a student pilot that's been led down the wrong path. So I, ha I clicked onto the person's profile and sure enough, I was horrified again because it, it's, uh, it's a flight instructor that came on and, and said that. Pretty, pretty incredible, if you ask me, that a, a flight instructor is advocating that uh, we do things to a bare minimum on uh, the ACS. Let's talk about the ACS for a second, private pilot ACS. So what the ACS is, is the Airman Certification Standards in the, uh, in the USA for the FAA. So basically, this is testing standards for... Uh, a private pilot test. It's got the knowledge, risk management and skills section and the, uh, it's basically guidance for the examiner to conduct an exam. This is what can be tested and what the expectations are. And if we go down to the power on stall, we will read that and we will find out that the person that said this is absolutely correct. So in the uh, skills section, it says clear the area uh, select an entry altitude that will allow the task to be completed no lower than 1500 feet. Establish takeoff, departure or cruise configuration as specified by the evaluator and maintain coordinated flight throughout it. As the person said, set power as assigned by the evaluator to no less than 65% power. And I'll just read that again, to no less than 65% power. And then it's uh, telling you, you know, what the, the standard is for the actual stall. Um, to no less than 65% power. Now, my response to this person was, last I checked, full power is not less than 65% power. I don't train to tick boxes. I train to create safe, skilled, and conscientious pilots. A power on stall is essentially a takeoff stall. We take off with full power. We will stall with full power. And then I dropped my phone like a microphone, and I left the room. To suggest that doing things to a minimum based on something that the ACS says, uh, I think that is, is very dangerous. To train somebody with the mindset of, okay, we're just gonna do things to be able to get you through this test. I think that is so dangerous for aviation. If you're in college and you're doing an English class, whatever, do what you need to do to pass the test. This is not the same as that. This is people's lives in our hands that we need to take care of. And that is not taking care of it. Um, we are the future of aviation. We are literally training the future of aviation. And imagine, imagine, <laughs> imagine a student pilot that gets through, scrapes through the private pilot check ride and gets into the real world and has a scenario that you've not trained them for. That's got to sit on your conscience if something happens to that student on the back of you not showing them what they needed to be shown, you know? Y yes, the ACS is how to pass a test, but do we actually train to just pass that test? Absolutely not. Like, there, let's take the written test, for example. Like, let's all be honest, okay? There's been some things on the written tests that we study for during private pilot training, whatever rating or certificate you're going for. There's been parts of that written test that you've thought, I, I don't really get it, right? But you kind of, you study it as much as you can and you memorize it as much as you can to be able to pass it on the test. And then you get past the test, you finish it, you do well, you either get those questions right or you get them wrong, but you've got a lot of other questions right and you pass that written exam. You dump some of the knowledge. Let's be honest, we do, we're humans, we do. We dump knowledge. Imagine if that was the mindset going into a practical exam for being a pilot. 
imagine you go in with just trying to scrape through with the bare minimum and that's it. You're not really thinking about the real world, how naturally to do a stall recovery, understanding the aerodynamics of a stall recovery, understanding the different power settings in a stall recovery. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you're being trained at that point to tick a box and that's not the way it should go. And in all honesty, the examiner is going to catch you out if you are being trained like that. They, they really are, and, and rightly so. The, the role of a flight instructor is, is really quite simple. As a CFI, you should be leading a course of training that will create a pilot that is ready for anything to happen in the real world. Going back to the situation, the power on store that I was showing was in a 172 that we take off with full power. There's no problem stalling with full power. You know, I'm not advocating in aircraft that, you know, it's not safe to do so. Obviously don't do a, a full power stall. Um, but for the most part, when you're in private pilot training, you're doing it in these light aircraft, which absolutely are fine to stall full power. Don't get me wrong. I, full, full power stalls are probably my least favorite thing to do uh, while flying. I don't like them. I don't at all. The the some aircraft do struggle to stall with full power. It's absolutely true. But the fact of the matter is, if you're a student that's never been taught to do a, 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 a stall in different at different power settings at full power or whatever takeoff power might be for your particular aircraft, I, I, that's that's careless. That's lazy instructing. In, in my opinion, it's very, very lazy instruction. It's an instructor that doesn't care about creating safe pilots. It's an instructor that doesn't care about showing real world scenarios and, and showing what could happen and creating a safety mindset in a student. Uh, it's, it's an instructor that's depriving a student of that real world scenario. It really is. Like imagine a student goes out on the first flight after the check ride, they scrape through the check ride, they go out and they go full power in a Cessna 172 and they get themselves into a power on stall situation on takeoff and their instructor has only shown them uh, a power on the stall at 65 percent power w what's going to happen in that scenario get themselves into a stall and they think what would my instructor do what did my instructor tell me to do well he told me to only do it at 65 percent power so let's pull that power back and get back into that familiar situation imagine it might be an extreme example but it could happen on the back of poor instructing like this they may have just killed his former student and can you imagine if this <laughs> if an instructor is actually scared of doing a power on stall at full power that that is arguably even worse. None of this really matters though, does it? Because the instructor has already been paid. The student's paid the instructor. He's got the money. He's laughing. You know, they've, they've, they've got the money, they've dipped out. Nah, you're actually, you're being paid as a flight instructor to keep people safe. It's not about you as the instructor. It's about the student. Not just while you're training them, not just while they are in your hands while you are going through that course of training. But for the skies beyond that training course, you know, that's all I've got to say on that. I, I, I think it's a very dangerous attitude to have to just train a pilot to tick a box and to pass a test. It's That's not the way we should be doing things. Everybody does things differently, but I think there's some fundamental things that uh, we all should be doing the same. And that is one of them, in uh, my opinion. Now, on to lighter news. Trevor Jacobs is going to jail for six months. No, no, I, I don't actually, I don't want to say that. Uh, that's that's quite uh, quite harsh of me to say, but as young Bob and I say when we're playing Fortnite, if you f*** around, you're going to find out, and there's a graph to prove it. The more you f*** around, the more you find out, and he f***ed around, and he's finding out. There's uh, On justice.gov, there's a California district attorney, Santa Barbara County man sentenced to six months in prison for obstructing federal probe into plane crash he posted on YouTube. If you are not familiar with this, to play a little bit of it now, a pilot who deliberately crashed his plane in Santa Barbara County and posted it on YouTube has been sentenced to six months in federal prison. Oh my God. Get me out of this. Trevor Jacob earlier pleaded guilty to destruction and concealment with the intent to obstruct a federal investigation. I don't usually comment on other people's uh, aviation videos but I, I felt 
compelled to comment uh, on that and we'll, we'll go through that in uh, in a second i think this was uh, universally condemned by the aviation community and uh, rightly so so let's go through this shall we a youtuber pilot was sentenced today to six months in federal prison for obstructing a federal investigation by deliberately destroying the wreckage of an airplane that he intentionally crashed in santa barbara county to gain views online now that little those those four little words at the end of that to gain views online are a big thing why i hated this uh this video. Jacob pleaded guilty on June 30th to one count of destruction and concealment with the intent to obstruct a federal investigation. Sounds like a really good guy. Sounds like a guy that you'd want flying you. Jacob is an experienced pilot, skydiver and dickhead. Oh no, that's sorry. That's, that's an ad lib. And former Olympic athlete who secured a sponsorship deal from a company that sold various products, including a wallet. Pursuant uh, to the sponsorship deal, Jacob agreed to promote the company's wallet in a YouTube video that he would post. On November tw uh, 24th, 2021, Jacob took off in his airplane on a solo flight purportedly destined for Mammoth Lakes. Jacob did not intend to reach his destination, but instead planned to eject from his aircraft during the flight and video himself parachuting to the ground and his aeroplane as it descended and crashed. Prior to taking off, Jacob mounted several uh, video cameras and equipped himself with a parachute. As you do normally, because we all fly with parachutes on our back, don't we? we? We do, that's the standard procedure. Video camera and selfie stick. Selfie stick, selfie stick. Approximately 35 minutes after taking off, while above the Los Padres National Forest near Santa Maria, Jacob ejected from the aircraft and videoed himself parachuting to the ground. Because if there's one thing that you should be doing in the middle of an emergency is pulling out a massive selfie stick and videoing yourself as you plummet into the ground that is that is in my course of training forget ticking boxes in the acs that's a real world scenario using the video camera mounted on the selfie stick the video cameras he mounted on the airplane jacob was able to record the aircraft as it descended and crashed into a dry bush area in los padres national forest after parachuting to the ground jacob hiked to the location of the wreck and recovered the data recording the containing the video recording of his flight and the crash of the aeroplane. On November 26, 2021, Jacob informed the NTSB about the plane crash. The NTSB... <laughs> as, as if... As if they're not going to find out what happened. As, as if. You let the NTSB know and then you go and post a video on YouTube about the whole thing. <laughs> what an idiot. The NTSB, which launched the investigation into the crash on or about the same day, told Jacob that he was responsible pre for preserving the wreckage so the agency could examine it. Jacob agreed to determine the crash location and provide both the coordinates of the down plane and videos of the crash to the investigators. I mean, he gave us all the videos, didn't he? Did he give the investigators a Ridge wallet, though? That is the question. We'll never know. Three days later, the FAA launched its own investigation into the plane crash, so they're all on this guy's tail now. In the weeks following the plane crash, Jacob lied to investigators that he did not know the wreckage's location. In fact, on December 10th, 2021, Jacob and a friend flew by helicopter to the wreckage site. There, Jacob used straps to secure the wreckage with a helicopter, lifted and carried it to Rancho Siskoc in Santa Barbara County, where it was loaded onto a trailer attached to Jacob's pickup truck. Uh, this, this is something out of Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> That's something you would do on GTA, which actually on my gaming channel, I've just uh, posted a reaction to the first Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer, which finally came out. So go over to my... Uh, gaming channel, Ludix Gaming. I'll put a link in the description on the YouTube uh, video uh, for that. Jacob drove the wreckage to Lompoc City Airport and unloaded it into a hangar. He then cut up and destroyed the airplane wreckage. This is like a murder. He's murdered something. He's cutting it up and he's trying to hide the evidence. That's what's going on. Deposited the detached parts of the wrecked aircraft into trash bins at the airport and elsewhere. So he's spreading out the limbs of his victim. This is meant that there should be there should be a Netflix documentary on this, which was done with the intent to obstruct federal authorities from investigating the November 24th plane crash. Just keep in, in your mind that this was all for YouTube views. All of this has come about because of his desire to make a video that people will click on. How mental is that? That is a thing that is happening. That is incredible. On December 23rd, 2021, Jacob uploaded a YouTube video titled, I crashed my airplane that contained a promotion of the wallet and depicted him parachuting from the plane and the aircraft's subsequent crash. Jacob intended to make money through the video. Yeah, no shit. 
That's all this was about. Jacob lied to federal investigators when he submitted an aircraft accident incident report that falsely indicated that the aircraft experienced a full loss of power approximately 35 minutes after takeoff. Well, yeah, it, it, it does experience that loss of power when you make it. Jacob also lied to an FAA aviation safety inspector when he said the airplane's engine had quit and because he could not identify any safe landing options, he parachuted out of the plane, which he just happened to have on his back while he was flying. So smart fellow, this guy. It appears that Jacob exercised exceptionally poor judgment in committing this offence, prosecutors argued. Jacob most likely committed this offence to generate social media and news coverage for himself and to obtain financial gain. No sh**. Nevertheless, this type of daredevil... I wouldn't call him a daredevil. I call him a dickhead. Conduct cannot be tolerated. So there we go. Uh, Trevor Jacobs has been sentenced to six months in federal prison. Now, some may argue that that's not enough time. Some may argue that that's more than enough time. Federal prison's no joke, I'm assuming. I've never been. It's hilarious because the video is still up on the channel. He starts then looking like an idiot. So my comment was, in quotes, I feel a lot of pilots can learn from my experience. That's one of the things that you put in the video. And to put that, for the, me seeing that as a person that is training the next generation of pilots, like we've been talking about, I feel like a lot of pilots can learn from my experience. That is so reckless, so reckless and so dangerous to put that in this type of video because... A student pilot may see this, they are so green, they are so clueless as to what goes on in aviation. They may think it's natural, a natural thing for if the engine fails for us to parachute out, that this is not a normal thing. So that was my, that was what caused me to have to comment on this video. Um, and I go on to say, I don't make a habit of commenting on other videos, but there is a lot of honest aviation channels working hard to entertain people. I'm talking about myself, to give myself a little plug. That aren't fabricating situations all for the views and claiming to want people to learn from it. This is the most reckless aviation video I think I've ever seen. It's a sad day for our community and for all the people that have died from real situations like this, having done all they could to turn the situation around. Poor, poor taste, mate. Pick the wrong video to incorporate a sponsor, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The, he, uh, he, this video was sponsored by uh, Ridge Wallet, so... Um, yeah, it was just a completely reckless thing and it kind of ties in with what we've been talking about, about training people to a higher standard. To claim that that is educational and helpful for pilots everywhere is just so reckless and so dishonest. And uh, the, the guy deserves his six months in, in federal prison. Uh, I don't think the guy needs to be in jail for the rest of his life for doing something like this. If he killed someone uh, as a result of the accident, then yeah, maybe. But in a previous episode of the podcast, I was speaking about uh, my thoughts on aviation content creation as well and how I think it's taken a turn to where people are more concerned with making videos that are going to get views than um, actual helpful aviation content. And this just goes to show that that's, that's what this guy's intention was. And I think it's a very dangerous game to play to put clickbait and um, aviation videos together and to make a video for the sole intention of getting a load of views. I completely disagree with it. Just like I completely disagree with flight instructors that only train to tick boxes. But anyway... That's been me on my soapbox today. If uh, you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please let me know. Like it, subscribe if you're not subscribed, follow me on Spotify. Uh, the podcast is also on Apple Podcasts as well. And uh, yeah, I appreciate your support. Go and subscribe to my brand new gaming channel, Ludix Gaming. That's on YouTube. We'll be doing some cool stuff on there soon. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.